great to be here. Uh, I understand that basically no one's allowed in the building if they were born before 1987, is that right? And uh, so, um, so in order to celebrate that, I made sure that all the cultural references in my talk are from uh, earlier than that, just to keep it kind of challenging and, and, uh, and all that stuff that Mark said. So look, what, I'm, what am I going to talk about? Um, I've been working on this fascinating project, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. I don't need to sell it to you because I think you've all been given a copy of the book. Um, and I'm not going to summarize uh, the 50 things, give you a list of my top 50. What I want to do is to talk to you about what I learned while I was producing this series for the BBC and while I was producing this book. And in particular, I, I think we, we get two things systematically wrong about technology, and I want to tell you what they are. So the first thing, and this is, of course, the first cultural reference that all of you are too young to get, but hopefully, you know, you have your VHSs or your... YouTubes or whatever it is, and you've, you've seen the movie. Does anybody know what this is? It's a cigarette. Yeah, it's bad for you kids. Don't smoke. And it, it's a, yeah? This is, Blade, well, this is Blade Runner, and it more specifically, this is a robot. A sort of organic, genetically engineered robot called a replicant. Her name is Rachel. And she is an unbelievably sophisticated piece of technology. It's so beguiling, so seductive is Rachel that our hero, Harrison Ford, the Blade Runner, whose job is to track down these rogue organic robots and, if necessary, to kill them, falls in love with her. That's, that's what an amazing piece of technology she is. She's got human memories. She is indistinguishable from a human without training and specialized equipment. And this is really a, a, a remarkable vision of a future technology. And as I say, our, our hero, Harrison Ford, Rick Deckard, falls in love with her, or he certainly has some kind of feelings for her. And when you fall in love with somebody, what do you do? You ask them out on a date, of course, old school. And how do you ask somebody out on a date? You phone him up on a big payphone on the wall of a bar. This is what he does. He's using this payphone. Because the film is from 1982, of course, they have a 1982 vision of what a phone looks like. And it's, it's not this kind of thing, or like an in-ear in thing, or, a, or a, a wristwatch communicator. It is this big box on the wall, and you stick a credit card in or some coins. It's covered in graffiti. And you, you make the call. And the only concession to the fact that this is in the future is that it's a video phone rather than just an audio line. By the way, she says no. Um, and this is the first kind of hint that, that we're, we're getting something wrong when we think about technology. And I don't want to blame Blade Runner. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie. This is the kind of mistake we make all the time. Um, but there's this weird disconnect between this unbelievably sophisticated vision of the technology embodied in Rachel and the idea that you will make no progress whatsoever in phone call technology. So what we do is we single out a particular kind of technology and we, we chase that and we focus on that. And we also get obsessed with highly sophisticated pieces of technology. When you think about technological change, very often, what you're thinking about is the, the bleeding edge stuff, the, the coolest, the most complex. And I think that's a mistake. So when I worked, started working on 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, I canvassed opinion, what should go in the book? I'm not necessarily looking for the 50 most important things. I'm looking for interesting angles. But everybody said, oh, you must put the Gutenberg printing press in the book. Movable type printing press revolutionary, and unbelievably disruptive, caused uh, bloody wars, religious upheaval, gave us the newspaper, gave us the novel, the scientific textbook, mass literacy. is an astonishingly important and disruptive piece of technology. And then I went to look at a Gutenberg Bible in the New York Public Library, 
which is an absolutely astonishing artifact. There are a few of them around the world. I do recommend you go and see one if you can. And I look, I look at these dense black columns of Latin text. It's hard to believe that this is the output of a machine. This is printed. I mean, the, the colored illustrations, they're hand-drawn. They're added later. But this thing is printed. This is designed to compete with the artisanal, organic calligraphy of hipster monks. It's an unbelievable document. Just one question. What's it printed on? It's printed on paper. I mean, not, not all Gutenberg Bibles are printed on paper. Some of them are printed on animal skin parchment, which goes some way to explaining why Gutenberg went bankrupt, because you cannot make the economics of printing work on animal skin. I did the maths. Trust me, maths is something I like to do. If you want to you get a print run, maybe 4,000 copies of a Bible, it's the kind of print run you might want, but to make it worth printing anything at all, you want a print run of 4,000 copies, you're going to have to kill half a million sheep. It's not going to work. To make mass-produced writing work, you need a mass-produced writing surface. And that writing surface is paper. And paper, for me, is emblematic of one of the things that we get wrong about technology. The Gutenberg Press, it's the Rachel the Organic Robot of the 1400s. This is the sophisticated technology we all focus on. This is the technology that changed the world. Would have been absolutely useless, would have had no impact whatsoever without paper. And what is so essential about paper? It's cheap. You know, the cost of something matters. Paper is 2,000 years old. but the first 1,000 years, it was in China. Then it moved to the Middle East. Islamic societies had mass literacy. They didn't have print. They had paper. Lots of people could read and write. An amazing, flourishing, literate society. Europeans, meanwhile, no use for paper at all. Why would you? Who needs paper? Now, paper is something you, you know, you, what, we, what we want is to make Bibles. And to, to offer a cheap material to make Bibles, that's like saying, I've got a cheaper metal you can make the king's crown out of. So I don't, I'm not interested in that. So there's no interest whatsoever until a commercial class, Italian merchants from the city-states, started saying, well, we need something cheap to write our accounts, contracts, messages, letters, receipts. Then paper starts to come in. And by the 1400s, actually the late 1300s, it's arrived in Mainz. And there, Johannes Gutenberg encounters it. And he's able to combine it with the printing press. So don't overlook the simple, inexpensive inventions. Because once something gets so cheap that you can wipe anything you want to wipe with it, it's cheap enough to change the world. I mean, an another example, solar power. Solar power, famously, this graph is from the FT, coming down in price. It's not because of a dramatic technological breakthrough. It is because we're making the same sort of basic uh, improvements in logistics and assembly, economies of scale in manufacturing. The same things that gave us IKEA's Billy bookcase are now giving us cheap solar energy. It's easy to overlook this kind of thing. And another favorite example, beloved of nerds, is the shipping container did more to fuel free trade and globalization than all the trade agreements you can think of. Absolutely transformative, but such a simple technology. It's 1850s technology that nobody could quite get together and uh, affect the social change required until the 1950s. And on the subject of social change, that's the other thing I want to talk about. So I said we, there are two things we get wrong about technology. First. We focus on the sophisticated, the organic robots, the, rep the replicants, and we, we miss the simple stuff, like the shipping container and paper. So what's the second thing we get wrong? Well, um, in an effort to really culturally bewilder you, I now want to show you a short video from Tomorrow's World in 1968. Does anyone even know what Tomorrow's World is? Tomorrow, yeah, OK, so you know what Tomorrow's World is. So Tomorrow's World is this ace program where uh, you, you just get to see enthusiastic people explaining what technology was going to be like in the future. And officially, the best ever Tomorrow's World presenter was James Burke. 
And officially, the best ever sequence shown in Tomorrow's World was in 1968, 50 years ago, where Tomorrow's World explained to us what the office of the future would look like. filing cabinets, no clutter, quiet, cool, very efficient. I need never get out of this chair. That'll be nice, no distractions, just me and the work, alone and efficient, alone. I wonder if anybody wants me, nobody to ask. Messages. Well, BJ39 will know, after all it works for me, I don't even have to go to it. Much better than a human being. Tireless and efficient. Anything I want, it brings. If you can name a single thing that they got right in that sequence, there is actually one thing they got right. There's one thing they got right. Yeah? The one thing they got right, he's asked to do some actual work and immediately self-medicates by pressing a button to check if he's got any messages. That is the one bit of utterly prescient thinking in that video. Everything else is completely wrong. And fundamentally, what has gone wrong is that there's zero social change pictured in the video. All the demure, very pretty, young, apparently unmarried secretaries in a typing pool, a typing pool, and the boss is wearing a three-piece suit and has the corner office, and uh, they, they basically, this is a vision of the office of 1968. Well, with technology just dumped into it, and the technology is, well, some, they're typing on some kind of computer, and he's got a robot that comes to him when he presses a button. Yeah? No social change whatsoever. That is a terrible way to think about technology. Because technologies do not generally just slot into whatever it is that we were already doing, but just a bit better. That's how we like to think of them. You know, we see our existing societies, and we see our existing problems, and we think, boom, you know, wouldn't it be great if someone could solve that problem? And that's what technology does. But that's not what technology does. Te technology reshapes us. Technology provides opportunities and dangers, and then we change our organizations and our societies to try to deal with those dangers or exploit them, and, and to try to take advantage of the technologies. There's a classic study of this from uh, economic historian Paul David, writing in 1990. Um, and um, Paul David asks us to contemplate the manufacturing of 1890. This is manufacturing 1890 in America. And if you had asked American manufacturing, uh, American experts on manufacturing, what was going to change manufacturing, they would have said electrification. Yeah? Electrification is what is going to change manufacturing. And what are we looking at here in this photograph? This is a group of workers, and they're, they're working on benches, and they're getting power for machines on the benches, like a, you know, a press or a steam hammer or a, a buzzsaw, or whatever it is they're working, work, working on. That power is coming from drive shafts on the ceiling via uh, belt drives. And the power of the drive shaft on the ceiling is coming from an enormous steam engine, which is outside the building. The steam engine is turning around and around, and the, the drive shaft's whirling around, and it's taking these belt drives. And very often, you'd have other secondary shafts off to the side. You might have two stories, three stories. There are belt drives taking power up to the second drive shaft, up to the third drive shaft. Everything is whirring, whirring all the time. It's being lubricated by hundreds of these drip oilers. The belts going up to the second story may be contained in belt towers to avoid someone's clothes being dragged in and then whipped up and drawn into the machine. This is the way manufacturing worked. And in 1890, 
the technology was available to replace those steam engines with big electric motors. You know, Tesla's, Tesla was working on them, Edison was working on them, Westinghouse was working on them. Edison is selling electricity as a commodity across a grid. So the experts are saying, yes, electric motors, that's what's going to change this. So uh, entrepreneurs would take out the steam engine and they would replace it with a giant electric motor. And what changed? Basically, nothing. There was no significant improvement. They saved a little bit of money on fuel. There was a little bit less coal dust, which is good if, the, if you're making, say, white clothes. But basically, nothing changed. Then, 30 years later, after America tightened up its borders in the wake of the First World War, it's hard to imagine such a thing happening now, but America just said, you know, we don't, we don't, don't want any more immigrants. So they tightened up borders. And at that point, factory owners can't rely on this um, influx of cheap labor. So they start rethinking how their factories work. And they realize the one thing you can do with an electric motor that you really can't do with a steam engine is you can make it very small and still be efficient. A small steam engine is unbelievably wasteful. You can, you can easily <coughs> replace a huge electric motor with 100 small electric motors. So they started doing that. And when you do that, other things start to become possible. So you can rip out all of these drive shafts, and you can replace them either with uh, window lights so to, to ceiling lights to let the, the air in, the light in, or you can replace them with uh, cranes that move around on the ceiling and help workers lift heavy equipment. Previously, the flow of machinery and uh, the flow of product around the factory was determined by the, the torque delivered by the shaft. You know, the stuff that needed a lot of power, you get it close to the drive shaft. Well, now you can deliver power anywhere through electric wires. So the whole factory can spread out and be organized so that step A, step B, step C, step C is all logical, all fits together. You can spread the factory out. It doesn't need to be this three-story thing. And because each worker is controlling his or her own workstation, they can start making more decisions. They're taking more responsibility for the product on you know, their own desk, their own workbench. So you, you need to start paying them differently, incentivizing them differently, training them differently, and maybe recruiting a different kind of person. At this point, 1920s, American manufacturing productivity soars in a way we have never seen before or since. It is utterly revolutionary. And it's all thanks to the electric motor. Plus, Rearranging your architecture, your product flow, your human resources strategy, your training, uh, your education, and the complementary uh, tools that you use. Once you've fixed that, electricity is a miracle. And Paul David, writing about all this, asked people in 1990 to think about what that means about the computer, the spreadsheet, the internet, the cell phone, the internet of things, all of these sorts of things. How are they going to change our society? Because they will change our society. And until they do, we're not going to enjoy the productivity gains. And remember, it took 30 years. You know, the World Wide Web is you know, about 30 years old now. But the smartphone is only 10 years old. These things take time, because we need to adjust. There's a study of this by uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, by the way. Before Eric Jolson became famous for writing about the fourth industrial revolution and so on, the second machine age, he and uh, his colleague Lauren Hitt studied the productivity um, and the profitability <coughs> excuse me, of firms in the 1990s. And what they found, it's a complicated 3D graph that I like because it's a complicated 3D graph, but what they basically found was, you go this way, that's more computers. You go this way into the graph, that's more decentralization you've reorganized. You go up, that's more money. So what they basically found is you get more computers, but you don't reorganize. It doesn't really help. If you reorganize, but you don't buy more computers, that doesn't help. If you actually do nothing, it's not the end of the world. But if you reorganize and you get the new technology, that is where the productivity comes from. <coughs> A final thought. 
if it's the simple stuff that matters, and if we should be looking about how, uh, looking at how we reorganize our workplace, a lot of people get quite concerned about the robots coming. The robots going to take over our jobs. I'm not worried about the robots taking over our jobs. What I am worried about is how our jobs may be changed by robots. They may change in you know, wonderful ways. I expect they will for some people. But there may also be downsides. This piece of technology is called Jennifer. Jennifer is, by the way, not the lady here. She's not an organic robot. Jennifer is the earpiece she's wearing. This woman's working in a warehouse, and Jennifer is saying you know, where she should go, which shelves she should go to, where on the shelves she should look, and what she should take off the set shelves. So if, for example, you want to buy 13 copies of you know, one of my previous books, say Adapt, which is very good, and by the way, is on sale, not in a big warehouse, but Dawn Books, the wonderful independent booksellers who've come here to IEA Think to, uh, to sell books, happy to sign them. If, but if instead, if instead you said, no, I want my book to be picked off a warehouse shelf by Jennifer uh, and by this lady who's wearing Jennifer, what happens is the unit will tell her where to go, exactly where to go. She doesn't need to think about where to go. And then when she gets to the right spot, the Jennifer unit will say, she wants 13 copies of Adapt. OK, take five copies off the shelf. OK, take five more copies off the shelf. OK, now take three more copies off the shelf. Why does she do it this way? Because you know what? Human beings lose count. And we don't want this woman to think. We want Jennifer to do the thinking. All we want is for her to wander around with her grabby hands and her eyes and pick things off the shelf. Yeah? That is an example of the way that technology can reshape the workplace. I don't think this is a vision of the future for everybody, but I do think it might be the vision of the future for some. And so when I think about the amazing opportunities that technology provides us, and I also think about the threats, I am not worried about Rachel the organic robot. I am a little bit worried about Jennifer. Very happy to take some questions. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>